So in July 2021, I made this post that was kind of uh, recounting my COVID journey and my thoughts on it, and it was quite popular. So I figured that I would make a video version. It's sort of also a very long post, so it might be just better to cover it by video. A lot of people have asked me about my thoughts and did I change my tune or, or what. This sort of explains it. Um, I'm not going to read the post. I'm just going to sort of uh, explain it in my own words, but I am going to go through it here just to kind of remind me because, it, it, like I said, it did resonate with a lot of people. So in February, I first heard about the virus in, in uh, January 2020. I was quite early. My job is is tech and kind of understanding trends. I think I'm pretty good at it. I, I, I've, I've caught a lot of trends and, um, you know, kind of have a good nose for what might happen in the future. So I saw a lot of very concerning signs in, in January. I saw, you know, factories being shut down, uh, talking about in, uh, um, interference in the supply chain and, uh, you know, possibilities of this leading to a global recession. So I was quite I was quite concerned. Then I started seeing the, I started tracking COVID. Um, I saw the videos in China of people dropping dead in the streets. They'd just be walking down the street and, and, and dying. I saw the, uh, m you know, Chinese military running through the, uh, you know, the country, locking down buildings, spraying, you know, s s think about this now. Remember this visual? They're spraying around for, for, for COVID and locking people down, you know, very, very, very heavy handed. Then we, we heard about Italy. Everything was Italy, Italy, Italy. Italy was like a bomb went off. There was there was crying doctors. There was crying nurses. There was that same photo that we kept seeing about the overcrowded um, hospital room with people on ventilators. It was very 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 shocking. And we had the cruise ship. And we had this the first plane. There was the Seattle nursing home. There was this this very very scary thing around. But you know by February 2020, and I was totally terrified about it. It was an unknown risk. Um, with massive potential downside. That's something um, Nicholas Tlaib said. He was one of the people that influenced me, and I mentioned that later in this thread. And unfortunately, I think he was wrong, and I and I feel um, bad that I listened to him. But so by March, I was in full swing, um, you know, kind of hysteria mode, panic mode, you know, I, I and and prep mode. I wanted to protect my family. I was worried about something that had a seven percent CFR. My biggest mistake, the thing that I regret most was I don't necessarily regret, you, you know, prepping and, and preparing for the worst. Um, that was probably wise. What I do regret is anything that I contributed to hysteria. And I was sounding the alarm daily. I was doing daily videos like this. I was doing a lot of uh, a lot of tweets and a lot of talking, telling people, you got to take this seriously. This could be a really, really serious thing. And we don't know what the downside is. And the thing I regret most was kind of calling for, I never quite called for lockdowns or those kind of things. Um, but I did, I did feel like, I, I know I, one thing that I called for was a uh, state of emergency in Seattle. I thought that, that the, um, Seattle comic con was a terrible idea. I thought with a hundred thousand people, I thought we we're going to see 8,000 people die from going to comic con. And I'm obviously a comic book fan. And, uh, for, for, for me as, as kind of an, um, you know, liberty, free, free market kind of person to advocate shutting down a Comic Con, or at least declaring a state of emergency so, so that they can uh, um, get their insurance to cover the the, the rentals. Um, you know, was something I, I did. I never, I never was in favor of mandated anything. I'm not, I'm not a big favor of uh, mandated governments, but I certainly sounded the alarm. I feel like I was a fool to do that. You know, here's, here's the kind of post that I made. You know, this won't stop it. We must stop it. We must band together. We have freedom of movement. Uh, and we've, we've got to really knuckle down because of this and yada, yada, yada. I listened to the experts. I listened to the CDC. I listened to, uh, you know, Fauci. I listened to the WHO. I, w I was listening to the WHO briefings uh, almost daily in those days. And I and I even set up a, a couple extra accounts to, to sort of monitor this. I sort of pivoted our whole you know, I was thinking that our f whole firm would have to have a strategy that that and, and we did do that. We had a pretty good asset allocation strategy that, that worked out. But I listened to um, uh, 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 Nicholas Tlaib and um, Yanir Baryam, who was uh, someone that he recommended. They wrote a paper together and they were really behind a lot of this two weeks to flatten the curve. Yanir and his group. I thought that we, we were, you know, we were really facing something that was going to cause a lot of massive death and destruction in this country and I wanted to do everything I could. So I joined their group, uh, partly, uh, well, 100% because of Tlaib. I thought, um, you know, this is a smart guy. He knows math. He's logical. Um, these are a bunch of MIT scientists. Uh, I'm going to do what I can to help. So I, um, you know, I read, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I went, to, I went to these things. When it, when it came clear that there was ventilators, 
I'm not a scientist, but I, I can get things done. And when it became clear that ventilators were a thing because of Como, I was watching Como's briefings daily too, because of Como um, and others, I thought there was a ventilator shortage. And I said, well, all right, here's something I can do. I'm going to make this my mission. I'm going to make sure that nobody dies from not having a ventilator. If, if I can do anything about it, I'm going to make ventilators my mission. I'm going to rally all my resources. Every single thing I can do, it's not going to happen on my watch. I'm going to make sure people have ventilators. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make ventilators. I'm going to figure out how to make them with 3D printers. I'm going to find them. I'm going to source them. I'm going to get this done. That was my mission. That's where it gets interesting. So I put these posts out here. Uh, you know, please read. This is about you. Get ventilators. I mean, look at this. It's got a whole bunch of engagement. I wrote a Medium article. I said I joined this group. I said I'm going to be the ventilator guy. I got a bunch of scientists together. I put all this stuff together about how to find the ventilators, how we can make the parts. I was sourcing open source people. I'm working with 3D printers. I'm sharing plans, open source plans, figuring out what we can do on... Um, you, you, you know, approvals, all of this kind of thing. Um, we had a lot of calls. I, I wrote articles. I recruited people. I joined this group. I got a whole bunch of other people from that, great people who cared. You know, I had people volunteering to print out things. I had people bringing stuff down to their local ERs. And remember, everything was shut down at this, at this, at this point, which is also weird. Um, so, but by the time, so the New Yorker picked this up and they said, oh, you know, here's the geeks. What do they call it? MacGyver is taking on the ventilator shortage. Um, they picked that up in, um, in March. And by then I was, I remember the interview distinctly because I was walking around when I, when I took it and I remember I was already starting to say, Hmm, I'm concerned about the, the march of authoritarianism. I'm concerned about how this is turning out. And, um, the ventilator thing kind of really, really started turning the tide because I, I realized that they just, Como was just not accurate. <laughs> as simple as that. There was complex business deals where New York was paying $20,000 for ventilators worth $500. And they, there was, there really wasn't a demand. So that was one of the first things I was like, Hmm, wait a minute. I was trying to solve this problem. It doesn't look like there is a problem. It looks like somebody is, um, doing very complex and so we say interesting deals to say the least to 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 have these high uh markups on ventilators so i said oh there, there really it really was not a real thing and then i started thinking well what else is not real but simultaneously i saw this this um you know crackdown on on rights you know we saw these 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 italian mayors you know everybody was kind of laughing because they you know they're, they're they're very animated and very stereotypically italian and they're yelling in italian and using the hand gestures telling people stay indoors and stay indoors or i'm gonna smack you in your face kind of thing uh okay and, and then and then i saw i think it was a surfer in malibu and they said they're gonna arrest this surfer for being outside and i say whoa 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 wait a minute that's not in any of the, the who um y you know uh documentation that's not in anything that the cdc or any of these other people have said that doesn't make any sense at all that just doesn't make sense you don't need to wear a mask outside and you should be allowed to be outside because early on you know a couple months earlier we were all talking about you know this this uh, global pandemic with with potentially 7% CFR, you're going to have a whole bunch of people, um, you know, uh, getting sick and, and fresh air was one of the things that was talked about as a mitigation strategy. Like, okay, make sure you can get at least the well people in the house. If somebody's sick and quarantined in the house, get out of the house as much as possible, get fresh air, get sunlight. These are just natural, uh, you know, no brainers in, in terms of, of staying healthy. So I saw these restrictions on going off. So I said that, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, so then I saw this St. Patrick's Day thing. And I remember that distinctly because I was in a town at the time. I was, I was living in a city. And I was very, very sad and frustrated and uncomfortable that people were coming to St. Patrick's Day right two blocks down from where I was. I said, these idiots, these fools, they're going to die. They don't understand that they're risking their life. They're going to go to St. Patrick's Day. Same time of that, there was a woman on the news down in Florida who says, I'm going to church whether you try and stop me or not. Nothing's going to stop me. I said, what an idiot. She's going to die. Her and her people in the church are going to die because of their stubbornness. And then the USS Mercy came in and USS Comfort. Remember those ships sailing in to save the day? Well, the people in St. Patrick's Day didn't die. They didn't all drop dead. And the people who went to church in Florida didn't didn't all die. And we didn't need the USS Mercy or the USS Comfort. Those were marketing shows. So we were told to stay home. 
um, on this overload. Two weeks to flatten the curve. Two weeks to flatten the curve, they said. Well, we, we, we flattened the curve. Um, we said there was just going to be this overload on the hospital system, but there wasn't. There wasn't. They were empty. I had a lot of pushback of all the engagement on this thread. I had a lot of pushback on people like, no, it wasn't. Well, yeah, they were. There's a million videos of it on YouTube. There's there's dancing TikTok nurses sitting there dancing because they're so bored because everything was shut down. And I don't want to make this about a personal thing, but read the end of the tweet. Trust me, I know about hospitals, okay? Our son had two extremely serious surgeries, brain surgeries. We know exactly what the hospital situation is. They're empty almost everywhere in the country. A couple hospitals who are perpetually busy the Bronx kind of place is very, very busy city hospitals, which are always busy, stayed busy. But elective surgeries and stuff like that were canceled. Um, so the hospitals were empty. There's a whole bunch of videos of people driving up to their hospital, empty halls, empty parking lots. The, the, and look at the numbers. Also, you can go back and look at the numbers. The, C, the CDC, I think, can twist numbers, and I don't trust the government numbers. But lying about number of dead uh, or number of hospitalized is hard to do. You're not going to see outright lies. You may see manipulation of the data and, at that, and then that kind of thing. But go back and look at the data. I mean, here in New Hampshire, there's a couple of these months when everything was shut down. You couldn't go to the doctor. Cancer patients, other people like that couldn't 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 get their their visits. Um, and everybody's terrified over this idea of flattening the curve. Yet the hospitals were empty. And you go back and look at the cases if you don't believe the videos and you don't believe the anecdotal evidence, go back and look at the number of cases. There's whole states that were locked down. They had two, three, five, ten, a dozen cases, two dozen cases, tiny, tiny numbers, two dozen, two dozen deaths, uh, or I'm sorry, deaths even. And they had, you know, in some cases, very small number of cases, hundreds or thousands. And by the way, cases is a terrible way to measure things because cases just mean somebody passed a test and that's that's changing the definition of sick but i'll get to that in one second but anyway i got a lot of pushback on this hospitals were empty that's that's just a fact so you know i thought i thought about i i, I had called for panic and i regret that i was afraid of of unknown risk but once i saw the data and i once i saw what was happening and i and i saw that we didn't have that kind of risk but there, it's always a mistake to have even um, gone down the road of whether it's this science or that science. The mistake is in saying that government should, under any science, even if it was a 7% CR, CFR or a 90% CFR, we don't need government. If it's 97% CFR, believe me, nobody would go out anywhere. We were worried about that early on. We said, well, how are they going to get deliveries? Amazon drivers are going to be afraid to deliver because they're going to be af so afraid of the virus. Remember this. You got to remember now, in the light of all this gaslighting and changing, you got to remember what things were and what the fear that brought us into this. So now we've changed what sick means. You know, we said that, um, you, you know, say, say, well, you, you may have it and not even know it. And we have this asymptomatic, asymptomatic spread. And that's been widely, widely used. A lot of the cornerstones of this whole thing is the idea that you don't even know you're going to get it and you're going to pass it along and kill somebody. And there's not a lot of great evidence about that. And there is, there's other, there's other um, kind of claims that, that a lot of these viruses are just sort of in the world and they, they sort of stay dormant and they attack the systems when your systems are weak, which is why they come out in the winter. But the point is there's not, there's not solid scientific evidence that says, here's people with no symptoms at all who spread it to another person. So, and we also changed this idea of sick. You know, we changed this idea that says, um, you're endangering people by not wearing a mask. No, you're not. You're endangering people by not wearing, uh, not having a vaccine. No, you're not. Only if you're sick. And so we changed this idea. We changed the definition of sick to be anybody who fails a test. You know, you 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 know, and that's very easy to, to abuse, by the way, uh, for governments or tyrants or anything else. But it's just a, it's just a bad idea to say, oh, you're you're sick, even though we can't see anything that's sick, and you're tainted, and you could hurt somebody else. Um, so we changed. Uh, you, you know, we, we, we changed the defin definition of what sick means. And then we also say sick until proven innocent. Oh, you're dangerous. Well, how do you know that? I mean, I've had a couple tests where I know for 100% sure that if I had the test and I'm negative, I know that I'm, uh, you know, not sick uh, because the test says so. And yet in the United States, to get into the U.S., you need to pass a test that says you're negative. 
And then what do they do? They make you wear a mask on the plane. Why, why is that? If they know that everybody on the plane, if you have a plane where you are 100% certain that everybody on the plane has passed a negative test, and then you have them wear a mask, and then while you eat, you can put it down, and a lot of people cheat, and they keep their drink in their hand because they don't like the masks, and you think that's going to stop it? It just, again, just like the restrictions on people being outside, it does not make sense. It doesn't make sense. Um, I saw a mom get arrested at a playground. It horrified me. And now, now that thing doesn't horrify me because we've seen so much and we've seen so much worse. We see riots. I saw somebody in the Netherlands getting beaten by a, by a cop. You know, we've seen old people abused. We've seen all kinds of crazy things. But this idea, um, I wish that in, you know, January, February, March, I would have said, hey, watch out because you're going to see moms arrested for coming to playgrounds with their kid. And uh, sure enough, that's what we've seen. And now we're so desensitized to it. We think this is some kind of normal thing like, oh, yeah, sure. Government has this power and they shouldn't not under any circumstances, not even if the virus was was much, much, much worse. So it was deadly. It was less deadly than we feared. It wasn't much worse. It was much less bad. It is a it is a very dangerous and deadly flu. And the flu is a very bad and serious thing. Tens of thousands of people die from the flu every year. On hard years, it's over 100,000 in the United States. Um, and we do have years where the flu is 10 times worse or five times worse. That's a, that's a thing we've seen. It happened, it's happened many, many times, the 80s, the 90s, uh, probably pretty much every decade. We've had very, very bad flu years where ERs fill up, a lot of people die. Um, and... So we have all these restrictions and tyranny that's increased, but... Um, the places without the restrictions, like Sweden, didn't didn't have worse results. I thought Florida was so foolish when they didn't have the restrictions. And thank goodness for Florida's example, because without them doing what they did, we would have never known. After a while, people start to have common sense. They say, wait a minute, why isn't everybody just dying in Florida? Now, it's interesting. Some people think they, they have that narrative. They're like, oh, yeah, Florida is a mess. I mean, just today there was something trending. How do we fix Florida? Florida's doing fine. Sweden's doing fine. Um, and when I say fine, I mean no notable, noticeably worse difference. There's there's cherry picked data, which you got to be really careful. Somebody shared something with me yesterday saying these five hospitals are at the peak. Well, that that's just obviously a cherry picked data. Somebody was trying to make a thing to make it look like there's a lot, so they picked the, 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 the you know. And even just hospital capacity can be very easily manipulated. Just close some beds, and now you're above your capacity of beds. What you really need to do is look at the actual data of overall number of deaths, overall number of hospitalizations, and compare it over the last five years. And you'll see that, you know, this is kind of in line with a lot of what we've seen in the past. And if you called this an extremely bad, and I don't mean to discount it, I know that people die. I understand, flu is horrible. Um, but if you, if, you, if you refer to this as an extremely bad flu season or five times 5X flu or something like that, um, I think that's more accurate than the, than the kind of narratives that we have around this. So bad data, you know, ventilators and everything, and we, we, we saw it becoming more political, okay? So, so there was incentives when Trump was in office to make him look bad, and CNN was running the Chiron saying, you know, 200,000 deaths, 210,000 deaths, and the narrative was he's killing, he's killing, he's, you know, so it was very, very, very politicized. And then to fight back, it became, and he was also early on was sort of doubtful and who knows what, but um, overall, you had this kind of changing the, the death count um, to include anybody who had a positive test. So there's an incentive. And then we saw it in New York. You know, there's an incentive to, 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 to have these headlines. You know, the more dead, the more it serves a narrative. So very elderly people, 85 plus with, with serious health issues, cancer, heart disease, these kind of things, they, they, they were categorized as COVID deaths if they had COVID at any time, sometimes as much as 180 days before. Um, you even had shooting victims that were categorized as coding death. Here's one right here in this article, shot, shot, gunshot victims. You know, So it was politic politicization, which is horrible. You can't have uh, politics driving science. You know, um, Government is not the ones to do science. They decide that it's, it's, it's final. And that's not how science is. Final f science isn't final. Final is uh, science is ongoing, and you've got to, um, you know, test it, and test different opinions and that kind of thing. So now we see mass censorship, and it's um, the idea that it's just sort of like, oh, private companies can do what they want. It's it's really 
unfortunate at this stage we now have government actively involved with social media we have the cdc saying what's true and we have social media following that partly because of political pressure so short of technically yeah they're private companies but they're 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 being um forced or pushed or bullied into doing an official company line or party line or or government line on things and the idea that th that you delete science doctors can get in trouble you know that's just crazy so florida was one of the first to break for this he said he's not going to do a lockdown again it was a mistake and uh media again oh my gosh those crazy republicans they're so stupid them and their bibles and their guns they're all fools they're all gonna die texas too bunch of rednecks well again didn't didn't happen so the lockdowners were you know they're losing their grip it was very they, remember just just a few months ago and again total gaslighting right when the narrative started to change as the summer came around and people say wait a minute florida's open texas is open screw this i want to open I'm, I'm done i'm done with COVID. i want it back well that's when the narrative shift to 100 percent. oh it's all about the vaccine it's not that covid wasn't as bad as we thought and that maybe there's a lot of cases you know the local school in in my neighborhood was doing two tests a week they had all kinds of tests where the students had no symptoms and they'd quarantine them you know, those all count as cases you know i mean if that how do we know that five years ago we didn't have hundreds of thousands of people who were carrying around some virus they didn't know about it if they were never sick then why are we changing the definition of of, of being sick so we so we we push this narrative you know it's all about cases and 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 then and then so instead of instead of um letting this narrative continue that gee maybe it's just uh not as bad as we had originally assumed and maybe the reason that florida is doing okay is just because you know they're going on with life and dealing with whatever the consequences are they change the narrative oh no no it's the vaccine the vaccine saved the day vaccine 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 get it get it get it if you don't get it we're going to try our best to limit your freedoms we're going to try and have vax passports and this kind of thing and that's what we see now with uh you know new york and and france and stuff just absolutely unacceptable you can't have a government movement pass are you out of your mind just think think about systems think about upsec think about like how something gee how could that ever be abused well trivially easy you're literally one or two bad politicians away from total abuse all you in a system where government controls a movement passport based on science or health or whatever excuse the excuse doesn't matter if government controls that you have politicians that control it and all you need is a powerful politician whether it's a president or governor pick the least favorite person you have whether it's pelosi or trump or whoever uh, all you need is one of those people or somebody worse than them and then they just co-opt a scientist which is trivially easy they can get their you know college roommate who happens to be a phd and say oh here's my scientist and you, you, all freedom is lost you can't have government have that power you just can't it, you cannot do it you will lose all freedom you will lose all freedom it, you can't do it so we you know so we have this gaslighting oh it's all about the vaccine and now we have this very weird um bizarre push where we have government agencies taking our tax dollars to advertise the vaccine you have people talking about mandatory vax passports let me give you something to think about in a vax passport world de blasio wants to have vax passports in new york that includes all public places so and, and there's no exceptions if somebody has trauma or something like that no they still have to have it and that includes museums so you live in a timeline where a holocaust survivor could be prevented from going to a holocaust museum because she doesn't have her papers and that's not hyperbole that's not making a horrible you know nazi comparison that's that's an actual fact an actual fact that is undisputed under de blasio's rules a holocaust survivor or any other person wanting to attend the holocaust memorial or any other public place would need papers please papers please papers please mandated by the government mandated by the same people in new york who run the garbage contracts and the taxi medallion services are you serious think you cannot do it they've lied they've lied consistently we've seen our free freedoms destroyed more than maybe any generation in history more more certainly than anybody in the last 70 years or so in, in our country ever in our country this idea that you can restrict freedom is wrong 
And the idea that we get into debates over science, this is this is unfortunate. I watched the town um, school board meeting, local school board meeting, and they're all like, oh, is it this and this and this data and that data? And it's a bunch of conflicting stuff, a lot of it manipulated, some of it outright political, some of it outright wrong. But the, that's the wrong debate. You're going into Fauci's world where he wants you debating about what the science is. And the debate should be no amount of science gives you the right to have powers to destroy human rights. No amount of powers. That's why we have a constitution. That's why we have a bill of rights. Because when you allow government to have the excuse to abuse rights like that, you have total tyranny. It's as simple as that. Uh, you can never allow it. There's no asterisk on the Bill of Rights. There's nothing that says, oh, oh, uh, you know, you have the right to peaceably assemble unless Fauci says you can't or unless the CDC gives guidance. No, that's completely and totally unworkable because all you need is one bad guy in the CDC or one bad Fauci or one bad politician to tell them what to do. And you now have some government agency who can decide where you move and what you do. That doesn't make sense. They don't know the world better than citizens. They don't have a moral authority to do violence on peaceful people. And by the way, it is violence. If you're on the side of vaccine passports and you're on the side of mandated masks, you have to accept that you're on the side of violence. Now, you can try and justify that. You can say, oh, no, no, I get that it's violence, but it's worth it because it's saving even more lives. That's a very slippery slope, but you have to at least be that honest. You can't say it's not violence because you're making a threat against every person who wants to walk down the street and breathe the air. You're saying, if you don't put on a mask, I advocate people beating you with nightsticks or putting you in a cage or handcuffing you with metal and putting you in a car and bringing you to a jail. And if that's violent, that's violent. That's a horrible and violent act to do against your fellow person. So you, you shouldn't support these these things. Um, it's, a, it's a bad idea. It, it, it's a um, learning experience, I think, for a lot of people. But at the end of the day, violence against peaceful people is evil. And there's no way to have these policies without violence. And our country is, is headed into a very dangerous place. We, we, it's not as easy to have authoritarianism here as it is in other places. There's more people who fight back. There's more people who care about their rights. There was a woman yesterday I saw, I posted, she was, she was um, in New York. She's been a New Yorker 36 years. And she compared it to slavery. She said, we're not slaves. She's not going to have a passport and she's not going to have, she's not going to wear a mask. And when you have that and you're on the side who wants to, because she's not going to do it. I'll tell you right now, I can tell by her speech, you, you're going to have to cage her. Do you want to cage her? Would you do it yourself? Would you do it yourself if I said, hey, go go handcuff that guy? It's not a workable system. It cannot work and it will tear this country apart and there'll be a lot of bloodshed. You can't do it. You have to let each person do the risk. Government is not the pay. Joe Biden and Fauci and Trump are not better at deciding what is right for you than you are. If you are extremely afraid you can stay in, you can take the risks that you are able to take. And the world isn't fair. You know, if you're like, oh, well, I have an immunocompromised person. Okay, yeah, I get it. The world's not fair. The world's not fair. We have this virus going around, and that is too bad. You cannot use that as an excuse to do something worse. And by the way, the worst thing won't work. We, we look at the, I, if you if I show you the charts of places with strict mandates and, and non-strict mandates or no mandates, and I show you the charts of the spikes, you'll never ever be able to guess which one's which, and you'll never be able to say, if I show you charts, say, Where, when did they put the mask mandate? It's counterintuitive. Many of these charts, the opposite thing happens of what the, the people who did it thought. And the world is complex. There's a lot of people out there with unique medical situations, religious beliefs that should be accepted, PTSD, mental health issues, a million other things. There's a, there's a lot of people who just don't want to be uh, subjected to this. And some of them have really, really good reasons. And that's none of your business. You just don't have the right to advocate violence against them. That's the only way to have this work. So at the end of the day, all I'm asking for, all I'm begging for, I'm begging you to please don't advocate violence against me and peaceful people. That's it. That's all I'm asking you. Or just please don't do preemptive violence. Educate, talk about it, 
Tell people they should wear the vaccine, you know, have the vaccine, wear a mask, tell them they're stupid, do, uh, you know, campaigns, but don't advocate violence against peaceful people. If you do that, you're wrong. You're on the wrong side of history and you run the risk of wrecking the systems in the United States and elsewhere that will lead to total and complete tyranny. Let each person have the risks they want. Let each person uh, live their life freely. It's the only workable system. Our founding fathers knew that. It's true. It was true then. Uh, this has been my journey. Hopefully you see I'm genuine. I don't want to be a victim of violence. I want to uh, live my life. And I think that other people should be supported in that. Um, it's what our country is all about. If it makes you uncomfortable, I get it. But that, but that's the way the world is. The alternative is unworkable. We can't have a system where you have science by government and you have wide scale uh, continued abuse of rights. It just doesn't work. So please consider that. Um, hope this has been useful. Thanks.